Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for August 25th, 2017. On today's show, we'll go to the water cooler. HT will be talking about watching a Korean reality television show. Ben Pearson will be talking about visiting the Broad Museum. In the news, we'll be talking about another Joker movie that's apparently in development. Uh, Matt Reeves clarifies his comments on the Batman being part of the DCEU. Uh, the Obi-Wan movie's working title has been revealed. What, what, what does it tell us about the movie? A Starsky and Hutch reboot from James Gunn, uh, live action Teen Titans casting, and uh, some comments from James Cameron on Wonder Woman that you won't want to miss. And in the mailbag, uh, we'll be talking about um, Justice League and uh, if it will destroy everything that wonder woman has accomplished that's the question that's not my words that's the 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 uh <laughs> the, the, the listener uh with, with me on today's show are ben pearson hey what's going on and why tran Bui. hey everyone okay so uh i've already talked about what i have been up to this week with the Medge castle stuff and you can read i, I actually wrote up it in depth on the site you can read it uh on slash film.com if you want more of that than what I said earlier this, this week. Um, but HT, what have you been up to? So I recently discovered that Steven Yun was, who is from The Walking Dead and Okja, uh, was recently on this Korean reality series that I've watched a couple episodes of, but it's called The Return of Superman. And it's possibly the purest reality show you could ever ask for because it follows these celebrity dads for um, 48 48 hours in their life as they try to take care of their kids without the mom. So the mom goes away for like two days and the dad has to raise the kid uh, on his own with just with cameras and everything. And it's it's a lot of just like hapless dads kind of uh, trying to. make their way and like figure out what they've been missing this whole time with the moms taking care of everything. But it sparked a really great parenting, dad parenting uh, phenomenon in South Korea, which has been sort of more traditional in its gender roles. But mostly it sparked a lot of viral clips of adorable babies eating and being spoiled by celebrities because it's a super <laughs> popular show. So celebrities will come on and do like promotion for their current like movies or TV shows or music. Um, and usually it's mostly like Korean celebrities, but here uh, Steven Yun showed up, I'm presuming because he was promoting for Okja. Um, but it was adorable because he was playing with this one kid, William, who's a half Australian kid of an Australian comedian. And um, the kid cried immediately as soon as he saw Steven Yun, but they bonded after he fed him, of course. So there's a lot of your um, regular eating clips, just like kids eating or just adorable clips. So it's a lot. It's a really fun show. It's really pure. It's definitely something to watch when you're just kind of bogged down by the terrible news of 2017, because even if it's a reality show, it's definitely something that feels less scripted and just more about like these day to day lives of these Korean celebrities. And where can you watch this again? It's actually all on YouTube. So if you search for Return of Su- the Return of Superman, um, KBS is the channel. They have uploaded all the episodes with English subtitles, too. You have to press the little CC button, but they have everything up to, like, last week's episode of the of the episodes. And they're all, like, an hour and a half long. Um, I used to watch it for Tableau, who is a great Korean rapper from the group Epic High. Huh. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's a really good show. Ben, what have you been up to this past week? Uh, my wife and I on Saturday went to the Broad Museum in downtown Los Angeles for the first time. I is, always thought it was the Is that how the you Broad, pronounce it? Yeah, I always thought it was the Broad Museum because that's how it's spelled, but it's uh, it's named after like people's last names and it's like actually there it houses their collection, like this couple's collection and apparently the way that you pronounce their last name is Broad, so it's the Broad Museum. Um, it's a really cool like uh, contemporary art museum that just opened a couple years ago directly across the street from the Walt Disney Concert Hall in downtown LA. And we're not normally big um, museum goers, um, but we've been to a few here and there. And, and, and uh, if, if, if you're in LA, you see this thing all over your social media because there's tons of like spots of taking cool photos and not just selfies, just like 
amazing things to photograph. Yeah, they have like yeah, they have some cool stuff there. Um, there's a an exhibit that's like a ten foot tall recreation of dining room furniture that you can like walk around and walk underneath. And I guess the the um, artistic value in that, like the the drive of creating that piece, is to sort of transport you back to the feeling of childhood. You know, when you were little and like maybe wandering around underneath your dining room table as a kid or something. It's supposed to just like be able to bring you back to that state of mind. Um, there's like a giant uh, <laughs> a dog made out of what looks like uh, balloons, like balloon art. That's huge. It's probably like, I don't know, 15 feet tall or something like that. Um, but yeah, one of the bigger things that they have there right now is um, the Infinity Room, which is this experiential installation. It's only there until September 30th. But if you're talking about social media and the bro, this is like the big thing right now. It's like all over Instagram and it's like a big, um, that's what draws a lot of people to the museum. Uh, general admission to the bro is free, but you have to get there and then have like a separate ticket to make your way into this infinity room. And we were reading a little bit about it. Long story short, we didn't get into this thing, but, um, but we were reading about it and, Basically, each person can only be inside this room for somewhere between 45 seconds to one minute long. That's it. And they kick you out because they have such a high demand of people wanting to go and check it out. It's basically like um, a, a room with a ton of mirrors all around and then LED lights hanging everywhere. And it just looks like, you know, oh. space going off into infinity. It looks pretty cool based on the pictures that I've seen. Um, so. so not to interject, but DC had that exact same exhibit at the Hirshhorn Museum, the Infinity oh, awesome. Room, where you could only be there for like 30 seconds, take a picture and leave. Did you Sorry. see it? Yeah. No, I didn't get to because the line was so long. You had to get <laughs> yeah. there like in early hours in the morning, like 7, 6 a.m. just to get in line. And yeah. Get so into the- <laughs> and, and, and I went to the Broad, uh like I want to say a few months ago and I, I got there really early when it opened and it was already sold out by the time I got there. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. So that's really the only thing that I wanted to talk about was like how insane it is that the lines in this thing are that long and like how Instagram culture has like (laughs) co-opted museum culture in such a big way because we got there at like 2 p.m. And I asked the guy just for kicks. I knew there was no way we were going to get in, but I asked somebody working there like, hey, if we wanted to like put our name down on the waiting list for this thing, how long would it take? You know, what are the chances of us getting in? And he's like, oh, yeah, you could go put your name down, but it'll probably be like a five or six hour wait from that point until you get in. And people the line is insane. Like all day long, people are standing there for hours and hours and hours just to get 30 or 45 seconds in this room to take their selfies. It's so crazy to me, yeah. but, uh, and, and before yeah. that, I think they had the rain room, which like you, same thing you got to walk into and it was raining everywhere except for where you walk. So like you yeah. walk around and the rain would stop wherever you were. Yeah. Mm. My wife got to do that. She said it was really cool, but, um, I didn't get a chance to do that one, but yeah, anyway, that's, that's all. Uh, the, the exhibit is, um, going to be on display here until September 30th. So if you love the idea of waiting six hours for a (laughs) a 45 second to a minute long experience, then uh, go check it out at the road. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, let's move on to the news. Uh, We have a lot of DC stuff today to talk about. Um, I feel like lately it's been a lot of uh, Marvel, DC and Star Wars. And I assure you guys, we're going to cover more than just that. But um, just we can only cover what is out out there and what's interesting uh okay so yesterday we reported that dc is considering making a joker standalone movie where it's going to show the joker's origin story uh and a day later uh we found out that there's another joker movie in development this one a joker and harley quinn story that is going to be directed by the crazy stupid love filmmakers uh uh, brad omen wrote it up for the site yeah so the joker and harley quinn are getting their own spinoff movie uh this is going to be coming from the the guys who directed crazy stupid love uh, glenn Ficarra and john rickwa uh warner brothers and dc have um yeah, had these guys developing a story about the like criminally insane romance between the Joker and Harley. This is going to supposed to be taking place after Suicide Squad 2, so it's hard to speculate about where we're going to see them in this story. It's not sh- like it doesn't 
you know, we don't know if it's going to be like the beginning of their romance or if it's going to be sort of in media res as the, the action is going on. It takes place sort of at the same time as some of these other uh, DC films. This movie is going to be taking place in the DC extended universe. And now we have to specify that because the Joker origin story is not going to be in the DCEU. It's going to be part of Warner Brothers separate comic book universe of stories that they're, you know, these one-offs and standalones that they're doing. Um, but this one is supposed to be in the sort of main continuity, if you will. And uh, yeah, that's really all we know right now. It's um, supposed to just focus on their love story. So we're sort of assuming that's going to be something like the comic book version of Bonnie and Clyde. But um, we know that Jared Leto and Margot Robbie are involved. And we know that um, the, the studio is looking to make this a priority and they have to get it moving relatively quickly because they have to um, they have deals with Jared Leto and Margot Robbie of how long they can be on retainer essentially to play these characters. So they they sort of have to get while well, the getting's good, so to speak. I mean, I want to see more of Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn in these movies, but I'm not quite sure I'm interested in seeing more of Jared Leto as a Joker or this love story between the two. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like the the love story in Suicide Squad between uh, the Joker and Harley. It was like one of the worst things about it. It was like, you know, everybody was making jokes about how people were coming out of that movie and saying like, oh, hashtag relationship goals and all this stuff. And like people totally missing the point of like how poisonous that relationship is. And the idea of just making a whole movie about their the love story between these two damaged characters is like, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's a great idea. I'd prefer to see a Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy um, movie by the Crazy Stupid Love directors, because that sounds like fun. Yeah, and and that's another thing I should say, sorry to interrupt, is that um, Gotham City Sirens, which is the movie that Margot Robbie is supposed to be playing um, uh, Harley Quinn again, and that one's supposed to be more of like a a female-centric thing. I think Poison Ivy is supposed to be in that, maybe Catwoman. Mm -hmm. Some of the other DC, major DC female heroes and anti-heroes are supposed to be in that movie. That is also still on the table. Um, So this is a separate movie from that. So I just wanted to clarify. Uh, It certainly sounds like Warner Brothers does not know what they're doing. But uh, more on that later. Um, (laughs) Yesterday, we reported this quote from director Matt Reeves basically saying that the Batman would not be part of the DCEU. Uh, We did give you the quote, and that's exactly what he said. Um, but he's taking to Twitter now to clarify his statement. And it, and it was kind of like what you wrote in your article, HT, about... Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 anyways, yeah. What, what, what did he say in this clarification? Uh, so uh, Matt Reeves tweeted today that, of course, Batman will be part of the DC universe. Batman will be Batman. Um, in my comments from a while back, I was talking about the Batman being a story specifically about Batman not about others in the universe, that it wouldn't be filled with cameos servicing other stories, but just Batman by himself, which makes sense. It sounds like he was just saying that it wouldn't be burdened by any world building or cameos from the Justice League members, like movies like Batman v Superman or even um, Wonder Woman had. Wonder Woman had, you know, a cameo from uh, Ben Affleck's Batman in the form of like a letter and sort of a reference to her appearance in Justice League, but not strongly. So I'm guessing that Warner Bros is letting Matt Reeves do his own thing with Batman and just like let him be in his own little corner, which is kind of what I got the sense of even when he said it was a standalone film, which veered uncomfortably close to what the language they're using for the Joker movie, which is why everyone got so confused. But that's the case. Batman will be in the DCEU and it will be part of the same Justice League Batman Oh, that's too bad because now we can't see Alfred, you know, open up files on Batman's computer and play, you know, trailers <laughs> for upcoming DC films. Um, I'm so looking forward to that. Um, also in the news is uh, James Cameron is, you know, doing a lot of press recently and he was asked about Wonder Woman. James Cameron has always been a filmmaker who has had strong female leads in his films and. Um, And he was asked by The Guardian about Wonder Woman. He said all the self-congratulatory back-padding Hollywood's been doing over Wonder Woman 
has been so misguided. She's an objectified icon, and it's just male Hollywood doing the same old thing. I'm not saying I didn't like the movie, but to me, it's a step backwards. Sarah Connor was a beauty icon. It was not a beauty icon. She was strong. She was troubled. She was a terrible mother, and she earned the respect of the audience through pure grit. And to me, uh, the benefit of characters like Sarah is is so obvious. I mean, half the audience is female. Um, I I think it would be a mistake for me to comment on this when I have a woman on the podcast who <laughs> who could do a do a much better job. So HT, what do you what do you think of this comment from James Cameron? So, the word I hate the most is strong when describing strong female characters. Because when I think of strong female characters, I think of female characters who are, who are well-written, complex, and have their own agency, agency and motivations, not because they are kick-ass or have strong male qualities like Sarah Connor has in, that James Cameron is speaking of. So the way that James Cameron is speaking of Sarah Connor versus uh, Wonder Woman is he's kind of raising up these male strong qualities of like physical strength and ability to actually uh, hold their ground on the battlefield. Although Wonder Woman has that too um, versus feminine qualities, which are considered weaker, like compassion, like empathy. And I hate that those qualities are always considered weaker. They are not. They are. Or, or, or even beauty. I feel like. Or even the, beauty. Yeah. I think it's completely reductive the way that he's approaching Wonder Woman as a pinup icon. It sounds like he didn't even see the movie. He's just seeing, talking about her in the pop culture zeitgeist, and that's a whole other problem. But the Wonder Woman that we saw in the movie as played by Gal Gadot is everything that he says. She's complex. She has, you know, she has her own issues. She comes in with this very black and white worldview that gets changed throughout the course of the film, and she's flawed in that in those aspects. She's not just like this perfect. Um, wide-eyed uh, character who comes in just to be adored because she's beautiful. She has these strengths of character that make her worth cheering on and being a strong female character, which is the word, again, I hate. Um, but yeah, I dislike that sort of venerance that we have for female characters who only embody the what male characters have or like what we yeah. think of as great female characters like yeah a great not- a great female character isn't a great female character because it, they're more masculine than mm-hmm. than the general you know feminine archetype like i think that's a mistake agreed and i would like to say that sarah connor though she is a great character she kind of is this based in this sort of sort of old sense of or this archaic sense of how we think of strong women is that they're isolated they're not surrounded by other women. And I think that Wonder Woman, um, Diana, is so much stronger by being surrounded by all these other equally strong and complex female characters around her. And I really like that we're having more of that kind of representation that women can be strong with other women. They're, they don't have to be competing or you know thrown against each other. I have a lot to say about this, but again, James Cameron <laughs> is wrong. <laughs> And for our final piece of DC news on today's podcast, we have some live action Teen Titans casting that is colorblind. Mm -hmm. HT, you wrote this article for the site. What do we know? So Anna Diop was cast as Starfire in the Teen Titans live action series, which is simply called Titans. And it's going to be on Warner Bros. digital service. So it won't actually be under the CW, which is where Greg Berlanti mostly works, who is uh, helping to run the show. Um, as uh, the show is also being run by Akiva Goldsman and Jeff Johns. Uh, but they're going to be first, Teen Titans, or Titans rather, is going to be the first in the slate of DC branded uh, content to premiere on the digital service. Uh, aside from that, um, Anna Diop, she is an actress from 24 Legacy, and she is a black actress who's cast as Starfire, um, an orange skin princess or alien princess from uh, Tamaran. Yes, Tamaran. Uh, so there were some, when this casting first happened, I did see a few people on Twitter complaining about it, which was very odd to me because I don't understand why you complain about a black actress being cast as an orange skinned alien. But apparently they think that Starfire has more 
Caucasian qualities, but whatever. Um, Anna Diop, I'm sure, will play, will be great in the role. And she is another uh, notch on the sort of trend of colorblind casting that Greg Berlanti has really spearheaded in the DC TV universe, which is really exciting. And I hope that it will someday make its way over to um, lead superhero roles rather than just the supporting characters, as well as movies, yeah. hopefully. Um, but Greg Berlanti has been very adamant about having diverse casts in his shows. Uh, you, we saw that first with um, the casting of Iris West as a black actress, Candace Patton, uh, which resulted in us getting a black Wally West played by Kenyon, Kenyon Lonsdale. Um, we saw uh, Franz Alishane Drama take, I feel like I butchered his name, but he took on the role of <laughs> Jax. Uh, Firestorm, and um, we're going again. We saw uh, uh, with we saw uh, Anna Diop with Starfire, which is really exciting. Uh, so I I wrote in my article that this kind of trend that's going on, how uh, we're seeing it more in TV, but less so in movies. Uh, we do see uh, Chloe Bennett take on the role of the main character in Agents of Shield, and she is a half Asian actress um, who is. Uh, playing Daisy Johnson, who was a re- traditionally Caucasian in the comics. So that's really exciting. Um, but what I hope to see is maybe we'll see Miles Morales come on to the big screen at some point or have some sort of colorblind casting for a main superhero rather than just another white male named Chris as our <laughs> many you know, but heroes in the HG, Marvel Universe a, or DC Universe. Th- there's a lot of white males named Chris that need some work. So That's true. Oh, although... DC, the DCEU actually has been really good about um, racially forward, like, casting. Uh, Jason Momoa uh, was cast as Aquaman, and Jason Momoa is Polynesian. Aquaman has always traditionally been blonde and white. So that's another chance, another example of the DC, DC universe being uh, actually much, ironically, more, much more um, progressive when it comes to casting uh, people of color than Marvel. Yeah, where Marvel is getting flack for their Doctor Strange casting choices. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, that is that is enough of the DC news. We'll return to DC in the mailbag <laughs> later on. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but moving, moving up from DC, we'll go to Star Wars. Uh, the Obi Wan movie is reportedly uh, rumored to be in development, and we now knew know a working title for that project. Ben, what do we know? What does it mean? Yes, so uh, a website called Omega Underground says that the new working title for the Obi-Wan movie is Joshua Tree, and that is the name of a species of desert tree. It's also the name of a major national park here in Southern California. It's not too far from L.A. Um, As far as what this could mean, uh, there are a couple different things that that immediately came to mind for me. So one is that um, the, you know, calling this movie something that is like a a desert um, park immediately harkens to Tatooine, right? Like that's the key location that we think of when we think about Obi-Wan Kenobi because he spent so much of his life there and, uh, you know, looking over Luke and all of this. And that's where we first met him in the 1977 Star Wars film. So, And uh, and that's also where we assume this movie is going to take place in between Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope somewhere. Exactly. Yes. Uh, So it's possible that Lucasfilm already knows that they want to set this spinoff movie on Tatooine because, like you just mentioned, that seems like the most logical place for an Obi-Wan solo movie. Um, and in the article that I wrote on the, on the website, you can read about, uh, a possible, um, connection that the comics might have to what this movie could be. But, uh, at the, you know, it's possible that they could film some sequences in Joshua tree, but the script hasn't even been written yet. So I think it's way too early to start talking about stuff like that. I think in all likelihood, this working title, if indeed it is the real one, is more of just a nod to where we saw Obi-Wan first in 1977. Because if you look at the young Han Solo movie, that film's working title was Red Cup, which is just a play on the word solo and didn't actually tell us anything about that movie's story. So I'm not sure how much we can really extrapolate from this. 
But if you want to dive a little bit deeper, uh, I wrote some stuff uh, on SlashFilm.com that you can read about uh, the tree and the role of the tree in the Star Wars universe and this concept of force trees, which we've written about a bunch on the site um, in The yeah, Last and, Jedi. And, and, and this is stuff that like has come up just in the last couple of years. So it's not like, you know, old... Chron- you know legends chronology it's it's stuff that they are introducing for the future of star wars which makes me think maybe there's something there but who knows yeah yeah for sure and yeah there i mean this is i think you first wrote about it um with the shattered empire comics and that was in 2015 uh and then there's theoretically a tie to some force trees in the last jedi coming up so you can read all about that in the article at slash film.com but as of right now uh joshua tree is the working title for the obi-wan movie also in the news, James Gunn is reportedly working on a Starsky and Hutch reboot uh, that he might actually uh, direct for. Uh, yeah. So uh, we don't know very much about this. Um, the uh, Gunn has come out on Twitter and said that there's a lot of misinformation about the Starsky and Hutch TV show out there. Uh, we do know that the Hollywood Reporter story that reported this said that Paramount passed on it, and we know that Paramount didn't pass on it. Um, but we don't know if this is going to actually come about or not. I'm, I'm not a person that has strong ties to Starsky and Hutch. Uh, J- Jack Drew, who wrote the article on SlashFilm.com, is much more passionate about this franchise. Uh, I also didn't like that uh, that movie reboot that happened a few years ago. Uh, or a few years ago, 2004. Starring Ben Stiller and Owen Wilson. Uh, do either of you have any uh, love for Starsky and Hutch? Not really. I never even saw the reboot, so I do not know much about it. I didn't grow up watching the show, but at the time I liked the movie. And it was definitely one of the lesser uh, Ben Stiller, Owen Wilson comedies from around that era. But I, I thought it was charming enough. Um, I don't know about it just seems like another thing where they're just like, oh, name recognition, name recognition. Let's go. Let's go. People recognize this. So I don't know. I, I'm not thrilled about the idea. But if James Gunn is writing the script, uh, maybe he'll be able to sort of break through what is pretty probably a pretty outdated and lame premise for a a broadcast or a cable show or whatever these days. And maybe he can tap into something a little bit deeper that will make this worth watching. Yeah. And also, uh, James Gunn's supposedly doing that Knight Rider movie. I mean, (laughs) at least according to David Hasselhoff. So Peter, we said we weren't going to talk about Knight Rider anymore. (laughs) Okay. Uh, that is all for the news. Uh, let's jump into the mailbag. To submit your questions to the mailbag, send them to peter at slashfilm.com. Include your name and general geographic location so in case we mention it on the air. In today's mailbag, Ali from Saudi Arabia. We have listeners in Saudi Arabia. That's crazy. Uh, says, big fan of Slash Film for years. Wanted to ask, do you think Justice League will destroy everything that Wonder Woman has ac- accomplished for the DC Extended Universe? And let me clarify again that that was not my wording. That's Ali from Saudi Arabia. <laughs> um, so I think to approach this question, I, I think, I don't know, let's start off like, what do we think is happening here? Because it seems like there's a lot of, um, they're, they're course correcting. <laughs> uh, after Wonder Woman, they're, they're, they're changing the direction of, that the ship is going. Uh, ben, what do you think is going on? It's weird because we talked about this when we were sort of surprised by the news the other day. Hope and optimism were two of the big key words that Warner Brothers has sort of trotted out in the wake of the success of Wonder Woman. And they've talked about how they're going to um, shift the perspective of the DC extended universe uh like the cinematic movies to to embrace those terms right to uh bring a brighter uh tone to all of these movies uh but then with this whole new recent slate of information it's like now they're making a dark and gritty 80s style joke and joker origin story movie so that certainly doesn't sound like hopeful or optimistic so it does seem like they're and also going this Joker in... and Harley Quinn love story does not really sound that yeah, hopeful. I mean because that relationship is so terrible. But I think it's not just terrible; uh, it's toxic. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, it's like, I don't, so look, I, I like that DC is looking to, um, you know, separate themselves from Marvel. That's what they've been trying to do ever, you know, from the beginning, right? Uh, they've sort of like backed their way into a cinematic universe. They've been chasing Marvel from the start. And this is a good way of doing these one-offs, I think is a good way to uh, further distinguish themselves to, to say, um, Hey, we're going to be releasing movies in the theaters, you know, once every couple of years, Batman is going to be Ben Affleck in in one of them, and then maybe Batman is going to be somebody else in the other, or Jared Leto is going to be Joker, and then maybe the Joker is going to be somebody else in another one. So it's like I like the idea that they're looking to differentiate themselves, but I just don't know um, what their overall strategy is. If that's their strategy, if they're just like like Brad said in his article, it seems like they're just throwing everything at the wall and seeing what's going to stick. HT, what, what do you think? What, what do you think Warner Brothers needs to take away from Wonder Woman uh, so, going forward? I think that the Warner Brothers, Warner Brothers executives seem genuinely perplexed at what made Wonder Woman so successful, and that was, you know, the hope and the optimism, like Ben said earlier, that it, uh, like that Wonder Woman had in the movie, but also just the the aspirational qualities that. You know, it's what I go to DC for is that like these are larger than life figures and that's okay because they are inspirational uh, role models that you can, you know, look up to and try to uh, aspire towards. But I mean, I feel like they are somewhat attached to the Christopher Nolan um, sort of brand of that gritty realism and they know that Batman is their biggest moneymaker still despite Wonder Woman becoming the number one grossing movie of the summer this year and crossing the 800 million mark domestically I'm sorry and crossing the 800 million mark uh, worldwide Um, Uh, unfortunately those yellow guys are still worldwide (laughs) (laughs) that's true well you know can't fight them those minions (laughs) but um yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like they are torn between what made Wonder Woman uh, so successful, but also what has worked for them in the past. And I I don't understand what they're doing, honestly. I was really hopeful when Wonder Woman came out and they went through this whole pivot and we're like, we're going to be light. We're no longer going to be gritty. Um, we're going to be sidelining all our previous sort of uh, nihilistic driven dramas and um, sort of subversive superhero elements that we had in Batman v Superman and Man of Steel. But I feel like they don't understand Wonder Woman and they don't understand Superman because Superman is very much in the vein of what Wonder Woman was and he should be that. And he definitely, I feel like Warner Bros. Uh, kind of follows Zack Snyder's um, hatred towards Superman. They don't seem to know what to do with him. Did, and did you just call them Warner Bros? <laughs> Sorry, I. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that Warner Bros. The Bros at Warner. At Warner. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's. I don't know if it was if it's Justice Justice League that will outright destroy what Wonder Woman has accomplished in the DC Extended Universe, uh, quote unquote. But it might be whatever the Warner Brothers executives are trying to do with everything else. So. I'm going to I'm going to look at this. I'm going to choose to look at this a little bit more optimistically. I'm going to say that Justice League is going to be the last gasp of the stylistic uh like the aesthetic that Warner Brothers has committed to with the DC extended universe. And I think I'm guessing that this is going to be the last project that the last major superhero movie in the DCEU that Zack Snyder directs for them. I think we wrote an article not long ago that was about how he is sort of scaling back, or they, I guess, are scaling back the Snyder's involvement overall. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that they have seen the outpouring of love for Wonder Woman, and I, I have to think that, especially with the movie being as financially successful as it is, and as critically beloved beloved as it is, that they are going to see that and try to cater their future things toward that mentality as much as possible. So I think Justice League, I think 
I, I hope that uh, Joss Whedon is going to be able to curb some of Zack Snyder's worst tendencies as a filmmaker. Um, but I, even if it's bad, I'm not ready to write off the DCEU yet because I think we're still, I think they're very much like in stasis right now or like in, in um, they're shifting, right? Like they're, right. they're, they're still in the middle of that pivot. And I think, uh, I think we aren't going to really know what the DCEU what they want that to look like for another couple of years. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to I'm going to hope that they know what they're doing in the long term and are just going to yeah, like yeah. lean toward what people like. I just hope they don't see Wonder Woman as a fluke, like a lot of Hollywood has often seen female led movies or um minority-led movies as flukes whenever they become successful, um, right. see Bridesmaids, see Girls Trip. I hope that they see Wonder Woman as the beginning of a new uh, era instead of just, oh, this was a fluke accident. We're not going to have another female-led movie just because you know it was all of these elements that made this successful, not just people want more of women. People want more of hope and compassion, you know? Yeah, totally. And, and to what you said earlier, studios have a history of looking at things and taking the wrong uh, lessons from mm-hmm. things. I, I think they looked at the Nolan films and not just Warner brothers, but all of Hollywood looked at the Nolan Batman movies and were like, Oh, people want gritty and real. And I don't think that's the lesson to be taken from, you know, the dark Knight. the dark Knight's like, you know, probably one of my favorite movies. I'm not sure if it's in my top 10. Uh, but I think the lesson there is people want something that isn't stupid you know, a, a superhero movie that isn't stupid. They want something that's smart, uh, that is created by an auteur filmmaker and, you know, isn't playing to the lowest common denominator. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the lesson they should have took. Um, I, I'm not a Zack Snyder hater. Um, I also don't love uh, Batman vs Superman. I like Man of Steel. Um and I, I just think that Warner Brothers probably picked the wrong director for this, so- for this universe. Not to go, not to analyze too deeply into the pop culture landscape, but I think that the time that the Nolan movies came on, uh, you know, it was like this post 9 11 time where a lot of films were becoming much darker and much more realistic. And that really reflected, you know, the political and pop culture landscape at the time. But now I'm going to go political in this era of Trump and just awful things happening in the news every day. People are looking towards escapism, which is why I think Warner Brothers, Warner Brothers, I keep saying bros, <laughs> Warner Brothers um, is at a confusing point because they don't know whether to look at the past success of those films at that certain time um, in the last 10 years or to look at what audiences want now, which is the escapist optimism of Wonder Woman. I know we're past the 1980s and we're past the montage stage of movies. But as a kid, I used to watch the, you know, Richard Donner Superman movie. And I used to love in in the 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 sequels to that. And I used to love those montages of Superman saving people. And it's fun, hopeful, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I, I, I just you don't get that from. I mean, even Wonder Woman, I don't think, has enough of that. And I feel like DC should be heading in that direction. Uh, I mean, I know that that you can go in that direction and get to Hallmark uh, (laughs) Channel-ish. But but I think that's something that uh, that, uh, Marvel isn't doing. And I think, you know, I I think it is smart for Warner Brothers to try to do something different than Marvel. And I think, I think in the end, them trying to create the cinematic universe this dceu felt too much like they were trying to be do what marvel was doing i mean essentially you know justice league i know there hasn't been much out but you know there's this bad guy that's trying to collect these boxes and then once he's, he gets these boxes he can destroy the world it, it's essentially thanos and i know it's mm-hmm. from the comics and i know you know i'm not sure who came first or what but it is kind of like the same thing so yeah, I think when it comes down to it, it's all about what HT said earlier about the aspirational qualities of these characters. These are supposed to be people that are the best of us and they represent the things that we should be hoping to be and, and you know, trying to shape ourselves into being more like Superman. And that means more, uh, 
more of those scenes you're talking about, Peter, more, you know, um, uh, empathetic toward other people and like looking to save people instead of brooding all the time. So I think if they can just embrace that idea and then build everything else around that, I think they'll be able to come out of this okay. Um, and and that's different enough from Marvel where I feel like they'll still be able to do that. Because Marvel, you know, Marvel movies are great, but there's a lot of like snark and stuff in there too. There are some heartfelt moments here and there as yeah. well. Um, but there's a lot of uh, like the humor and stuff in, in Marvel movies and like the general attitude of Marvel movies is different than the uh yeah the aspirational qualities that that we saw in wonder woman so i think if they really you know embrace that they'll be fine i agree with both of you completely i feel like um what peter was saying before dc was trying too hard to both be like marvel but be the opposite of them at the same time so instead of going light and funny they went dark and gritty but i think with wonder woman they could do something completely different than what marvel is doing and just go for the earnestness that wonder woman showed like you guys were both saying because marvel has always been you know, very funny and very glib, but I feel like they don't have enough of those genuine hero moments that we saw in Wonder Woman. And I feel like DC could build a whole brand off of that because that's what I come to DC for. And I think that's what a lot of people come to DC for. I guess we're just going to have to wait and see when Justice League comes out. I know I've already said this before, but it's going to be interesting because if this is a good movie, everybody's going to, you know, credit Joss Whedon and Jeff Johns. If this is a bad movie, it's, it's you know, all Zack Snyder's fault. Um, mm. And uh, I think that's unfair. But we'll have to see. We'll have to see w- w- where this heads. And uh, I'm sure in the next week we'll have another 10 DC standalone movies that are rumored <laughs> to be in development. So <laughs> we'll find out. Uh, you can find more of HT's uh, work on Slash Film and H Tran Buoy on Twitter. Uh, you can find Ben at Ben Pears on Twitter and on Slash Home. Uh, me at, at Slash Home and uh, on Slash Home.com, of course. Uh, if you have questions to submit to the mailbag, send them to Peter at Slash Home.com. You can subscribe to Slash Home Daily on iTunes, Google Play, Overcast, and all the popular podcast apps. Uh, this is published every weekday. Uh, so come back tomorrow. We'll have more. Please go to iTunes. Rate and review us, spread the word, help us out, and thanks for listening.